Greetings, Internet, and welcome to G-Score, the podcast, a symphonic history of the Godzilla series. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, Evan. And greetings, audience, and welcome back to G-Score. This is episode two, and we are going to be talking about the very rushed sequel to the original 1954 classic, Gojira. In this case, Godzilla raids again. Or Gigantus, the fire monster. More on that later, unfortunately. We have an explanation, don't worry. So, Godzilla raids again was a movie that was inspired by the all-powerful urge to make money. Gojira was a incredible success. By the end of its release, Godzilla had garnered some nine and a half million plus attendees in japan which made it i believe the eighth highest ranking film in japan in 1954 oh that was a good gamble it was a good gamble and if i'm not mistaken i think it actually won an award for best special effects in japan at the time oh it makes sense with Subarai on board and if i'm also not mistaken and i can't find a source that says this but i know i've read it before that the film was also nominated for best japanese picture really Mm-hmm. Though it never won. Oh, it, that's <clears throat> injustice. Sad. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. it went up against Seven Samurai. What do you expect? Oh, well, hmm. still. Yeah, still. So even though there was only about six months in making the original Godzilla, and this next film was made in about five months, give or take, it was really a rushed production. Instead of trying to create a nuclear allegory, They just essentially wanted to make a straightforward monster on the loose film in order order to capitalize on the sensation um, of Godzilla, which, you know, is what Hollywood does even to this day. Yeah, it was a very rushed production. I mean, with only with five months and it did fall into that typical formula of straight up monsters. And that's about it. It was even interesting that Tomoyuki Tanaka, he was told by Iwao Mori, uh, who was the producer at Toho, that he wanted a monster sequel as soon as possible. And in fact, he wanted Shiro Honda, but he was unavailable at the time due to directing another movie. And so fearful that he was going to lose that momentum of the first Godzilla and its success, he wanted a sequel as soon as possible. And so that's when he got Motoyoshi Oda. Who is kind of known as a, a studio hack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And kind of a second-rate director. And, and that and that kind of shows. Because in this movie, whereas Honda has a very documentarian style about him, he takes his subjects very seriously. The movie has a very grounded realism to it, despite its fantastic premise and super weapons. This movie feels more like it's a soap opera family drama that happens to be stitched together with a random monster on the run film. And honestly, it does have that feeling of like two different movies fighting with each other to be the main movie. And every time the humans are on, you just kind of wish that the monsters would come back because the only action that the humans engage in is talking. They either are standing and talking or sitting and talking, or they're, they're just always in a room, static, having dialogue with one another. Yeah, because at least with Gogeta, you know, you felt for the characters and there was a way more complex issues going on between that. So even though, yeah, in Gogeta there are moments of human interaction, it was interesting human interaction. It may sound like we are kind of talking down about this movie as in it, it was a letdown. And the reason is because, yes, we are. And it was. <laughs> I mean, it was riding off the coattail of Gogeta. It was only five months. So you can imagine this thing had a lot of weight on it. It had a lot of pressure to try and live up to that. And unfortunately, with a lot of people who just didn't show up with like Oshiro Honda and Akira Fukube, it's just it just wasn't going to happen. It just sincerely wasn't. But that's also to be expected because, like you said, it was resting on the laurels of its predecessor. And Gojira itself was made with some huge motivation from multiple angles. There's a lot of heart and passion and blood and sweat and tears and talent put into it. And the people that were working on it really believed in it, whether it was Ifukube or Honda or Tsuburaya or Tanaka. And in this one, it was like, whoa, we got such a hit on our hands. Quick, make another one. And, money yeah and they did and they did and 
But at what cost? At what, well, at, at the cost of having a second-rate team make a second-rate film. Now, when I say second-rate team, I'm excluding Tsuburaya because that special effects master does return in this film. And, his and Haruo character. Nakajima. Yeah, and Haruo Nakajima is Godzilla. And the special effects are wonderful. I mean, the suit doesn't look as good. It's been slimmed down so that way Nakajima's got more mobility and uh, can perform quicker action stunts. But if you ever just see a production still of the suit, it kind of looks a little goofy. It looks like the original Godzilla suit went on a severe slim fast treatment and it didn't turn out well. Angudas, which is the new kaiju in the film, and would go on to become a fan favorite and star in several movies. Uh, looks all right. He's very in, he's a very inspired design. Um, he's supposed to be a type of Ankylosaurus, and it shows. Though I prefer his redesign in later films. And the model work, which is what I love most about this movie, the model work is just absolutely fantastic. The buildings, the structures, the refinery, the ships, even the tanks and the cannons and the airplanes... All of them are just top-notch. Tsuburai really outdoes himself. There are some incredible destruction and action sequences in this movie uh, as far as uh, the, mini the miniatures are concerned. And the suits blend very well into it, and I think the movie is benefited again by this being filmed in a uh, grainy, film noir-esque, black-and-white um, cinematography style. And this movie it was going to create a huge staple that would be seen throughout the series. I mean, this was going to be the first kaiju battle ever in the Godzilla series. The first which... kaiju battle ever, period. Yes, yes. Because the interesting thing is with other movies, say like with Kong, when he battles other monsters, it's very brief and it's seen as more of like an inconvenience. This is part of the main plot, you see. And so that was going to be a recurring thing throughout every, almost every Godzilla movie. And even in the title, you'll see Godzilla versus King Ghidorah, Godzilla versus Megalon versus, you know, it was an important movie because this was a turning point in many regards. It, it is interesting that though this film introduces the perhaps the single most famous and perhaps even important element of the Godzilla franchise, which is monster battles. And I say perhaps because it might just be second only to Godzilla himself smashing a city. It didn't exactly catch on as a award-winning formula. Now, the movie itself actually did financially fairly well. I said that the first movie brought in some nine and a half million people. This movie brought in a little under eight and a half million people. So not as successful as the first one, but it did remarkably well. But uh, interestingly, this did not start a Godzilla franchise. There's another seven years before we see the next Godzilla movie. And during that time... Toho experimented with all kinds of science fiction and horror films like The H-Man, The Mysterians, Varan, Mothra, Rodan, and, and some of them were great successes, and some of them are fantastic movies. But Godzilla is nowhere to be seen, and none of these creatures are engaging in battles. You know, Rodan does not fight, you know, a giant Meganula, or there's no Mothra versus Rodan. It's, it's like like the introductory films in the MCU for superheroes. It's like, oh, Iron Man's got his film. Hulk has his film. Captain America's got his film. Thor has his film. It's like, well, Godzilla had his. Mothra gets his. Varan gets his. Rodan gets his. It was all very standalone. That was still the award-winning formula, which was, pre which was honestly started by King Kong. So even though Raids Again introduces the most arguably essential and successful element of the Godzilla franchise, it didn't spawn a franchise, and it did not inspire others to try and do the same thing. Case in point, the the battle in this film between Godzilla and Anguirus was not the climax of the movie, ironically. They battle halfway through the film, and Anguirus is killed. And then you still have yeah. half a movie to go through. But so I'll just assume that just like there was a second Godzilla that showed up in this movie, there was another Anguirus, because that thing got cremated. Oh yeah, he did. Cooked. We'll talk more about how the Godzilla franchise got launched into a solid, full-fledged franchise and how the monster versus monster formula was refined to a science in the next episode. But that was not this one. It's still an interesting movie, though. 
though it is rather slow, ponderous, and dare I say it? Say it. Dull. <laughs> it's a little boring. Yeah, it's quite unfortunate. I mean, especially when you have two monsters going at it. It's just, as we said before, yes, it's it was going to be difficult regardless trying to compete against Gogeta. However, at the same time, the motivations behind it and why this thing was made in the first place, even though, yes, technically anyone can say every movie is made for money. So, th- yes. But at least with Gogeta, you can tell there was a lot more than just money behind it. And so it's rather interesting how some directors or some studios can be caught in this middle ground of wanting to be different, but not too different at the same time. And unfortunately, I feel like the differences that they did choose for the most part were misses. Although the inclusion of Anguirus and the Kaiju battle was a plus in my book. That was definitely but, the highlight of the movie. Yes, it was. Although there was some camera trouble going on with between their fights, wasn't there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there, there seemed to be some inconsistencies. Typically with a, and this wasn't done all the time. I don't think it was actually used in the next movie, but typically in a kaiju film, especially in a Godzilla movie, they have a neat technique to make the suit look like it's bigger and heavier and more massive than it really is. And that is when they film the suit actor doing his performance at high speed. Nakajima doesn't walk around like a guy in a Barney costume. He actually has to move around in this 250 pound suit at lightning speed. That means you see buildings crumbling hyper fast. You see explosions going off in the blink of an eye and everything like an entire scene that might play out as 15 seconds long on film might actually only take three or four seconds to execute. And the reason is because they're filming at high speed. I think it's something like 72 frames or 74 frames per second. I have to check my numbers, but 70 X frames per second played back to it's not even 24 frames per second. I think it might be played back at like 18 or 19 frames per second. And mm-hmm. it gives the sensation that this six foot tall suit, or perhaps even shorter than that, is actually a 150 foot tall monster that weighs 20,000 tons, That which is a very cool technique. Unfortunately, it didn't always go as planned. Case in point. Some of the effects footage that was shot at a slower speed, which was 18 frames per second, there were supposed to be three cameras that supposedly were to capture the effects of the footage. And two of the cameras were set at a high speed, while the third one was accidentally left at a slow speed. But despite that, surprisingly, Subaraya felt the slow speed was usable. Since then, he used different camera speeds for different scenes. So Mm -hmm. he's got three cameras, and they're all Mm -hmm. supposed to be recording at high-speed photography, which means you're doing like 70 frames per second, give or take, and then it's going to be played back at something like, what was that, 18 frames per second? And one of the cameras was actually filming at a slow speed, so when you brought it up to normal speed, instead of making the action, a lot of people say Godzilla's filmed in slow motion. It's not slow motion. They're just slowing down the... uh, the footage to normal speed from a high speed. But when you film it at a, at a low speed and you play back at a normal speed, instead of looking slower, it looks faster. <laughs> so the effect was... It was shot at lightning speed. So they just look like they're just clawing each other's eyes out in a ridiculous speed. You know what it, it actually kind of reminds me of? is like a dog fight. Yeah, actually, and, that's a good description. And I, I know that... It, on one hand, it's very jarring because you see it one second, you see the animals, the animals, the kaiju moving at a slow, heavy pace, and then they uh, engage each other and they're moving at lightning speed. And it it can be silly. It can be jarring. I actually think it kind of adds an animalistic... Uh, Savagery, sav- almost. Yes. very primal. Yes, yes, yes. Like, like, like two lions or dogs that are just, you know, in a pit going after each other, fighting for scraps or something. And there's, it might be difficult to see, but you can even see traces of blood uh, on the costumes as well. Which is especially apparent when Godzilla gives Anguirus a, uh, a vampire A kiss of bite. death. Yes, a kiss of death on the neck. So we got the point. The movie was fairly lackluster. And unfortunately, it's a fairly forgettable entry in the Godzilla series. However, we do have a, a special guest star that we need to introduce, and that is a brand new composer.
His name is Masaru Sato. Sato, like Ifukube, was also born in Hokkaido. Apparently Hokkaido just is, it breeds genius musicians. And uh, Sato was, in fact, a pupil of Fumio Hayasaka. Now, Hayasaka was Akira Kurosawa's principal composer during the 40s and early 50s. Hayasaka, for instance, did the famous score for The Seven Samurai. Unfortunately, um, Hayasaka passed away in the mid-1950s, leaving his protege, Sato, to finish a couple of his scores that he wasn't able to because death has a way of stopping your career dead in its tracks. About that time, Sato was greenlit to score Godzilla Raids Again, which was one of his very first features as an up-and-coming composer in his own right. Even Sato later reflected that Raids Again was not his greatest achievement. He later bemoaned, saying, It's like listening to a kid trying to learn. And unfortunately, it kind of shows. Uh, I enjoy Sato's music quite a bit. He has a very unique style, and his style is almost like a jazz fusion. It's like traditional orchestral music, which often is accompanied with some sensibilities of classical or Japanese folk music mixed with pop music, especially jazz. And it lends itself to a very unique style. I mean, you could not get more black and white day and night than Ifukube and Sato. But unfortunately, that unique quirkiness that makes Sato's music so wonderful and playful and and personable is was not, not present in this film. <laughs> not at all. It was very different. Like when I realized it was Sato that who was going to compose this compared to other films that he does along the way, like with Ebra and Son of Godzilla and Mecha Godzilla, it feels very stripped of him. The the thing that makes him distinct is gone. And it's understandable that, yes, he was perhaps rushed into this. But at the same time, that kind of that quirky playfulness was not present that we're he's more famously known for. And he understood the shoes that he had to fill. He once commented in an interview many years later, saying, I knew I could not do the same thing that Mr. Ifukube did in the previous film. I had to do something unique. I felt that I could express Godzilla's passion in a way that was different from Mr. Ifukube's musical style. Later on, the director, Motoyoshi Oda, praised me, saying, Your music sounds American. The company tried me out, but they came to the conclusion later that Mr. Ifukube's music was better suited to the genre. Even though there were no monster fights in the first movie, Ifukube wrote some great action pieces. In this movie, we've got plenty of monster fights, and really no action music. Uh, aside from the, I should say, the unusually and maybe uncharacteristically upbeat main title, there really isn't any music in here that spurs you on. It, it almost feels like Sato's slow, brooding music slows the film down even more. It is kind of a neat contrast between the occasional high-speed monster battles and this very slow, ominous, dark tones, but you think that it would almost be more appropriate to occasionally have some kind of ener energy. Sato, though, explained, I didn't think the music should suggest that they were trying to kill each other. I felt the atmosphere of a game or competition was needed. Well, they technically were trying to kill each other, but... They were, and I, and I really don't understand how the music he wrote suggests a competition. Um, no, it was I mean, a I've bit seen, more brooding. I've seen, yeah, I've seen plenty of sports movies, and they don't have that depressing of music. Uh, the score is not horrendous. It has merit. I myself, mm -hmm. though I'm, I've been complaining about the brooding aspect of it, like the, um, the Godzilla, the Q when Godzilla enters Osaka Bay. Oh, that's one of my favorites. It, I agree. I like it. I, With the I, clashing symbols. Yes. And... Yes. It, it, it's a very foreboding piece of music. And it's. You my... can just see the water slowly moving into a dry, like a shark or something. And with that music building up, I did like that. Yeah. That's my favorite piece out of this one for sure. You know, uh, we, we talked about how little music was in the first Godzilla movie, making up only about 40 minutes or so of the film's runtime. Sato was even more minimalist. He barely clocks in at 30 minutes, 
for the entire score. And it was very bare bones. And that is going to also contribute to this being the shortest musical suite of our entire series because I've already created the musical suites for this entire podcast before we've recorded any of these episodes. And and these suites average anywhere from about 20 minutes to 45 minutes. Sato's barely scratching 12. But please don't judge this composer by this effort. Sato is an extremely talented uh, musician, whereas Ifukube kind of led a double life because he had one foot in the door with film composing. He had one foot in the door with writing classical concert music, and he had a third foot. I don't know where it came from, but he had a third foot in the door <laughs> teaching as the, um, the president of Tokyo University uh, Music School. Sato, though, on the other hand, devoted his time almost exclusively to film scores, 110%, and he did over 300 film scores. Now, I told you before that composers had very little time to write music. Ifukube himself sometimes did a dozen movies a year. Sato boasted that at the height of his career, he was doing up to 18 movies a year. That's ridiculous. Extremely ridiculous. That's the kind of productivity you get when you only give someone a week to write music. There was actually a little track that I enjoyed, even though technically it wasn't by Sato himself, but it was a song called Couple on a Lakeshore, and it was played during the club scene as the protagonist with his girlfriend, who was played by Setsuko Wakayama, and they dance slowly to it, and it brings this an atmosphere of relaxation, of peace, thinking that Godzilla's not going to come to Osaka, foolishly thinking so. Uh, and then it just stops and when they hear this announcement that he is coming. But for the brief time that they do enjoy the song, it consisted of a mixture of woodwinds, guitar, violin, cello, and some harp in there. And it's a nice contrast of something you think is peaceful, then all of a sudden a drastic change that terror is on its way. So I like that little uh, contrast and sudden abrupt change in it. It's a good mood setter. It certainly is. It's interesting with the starting of this soundtrack, we have our, obviously, main title. And this main title is pretty different from how Godzilla was uh, with Gogeta, the uh, original movie. With this, it has a more jaunty kind of heroic march going on. It even reminds me slightly of the theme of the 1933 uh King Kong in somewhat. It's very uh, upbeat. It's very allegro. And it's more reminiscent of the triumphant hero who is going to slay the dragon or slay the beast, so to speak. I guess in that way, it actually sounds a bit more like an American monster movie score uh, where you have more brazen heroism where the monster is slewn at the end and uh, and the hero is triumphant and comes marching home and he's got the girl in arm. It, it has more of that adventure or action-oriented Hollywood feel to it than it does what would come to define the kaiju genre sound as a whole, especially those coming from the Toho studios. What makes this music peculiar, if I may use that word, is not the music itself. The That piece of music is fine and dandy all for itself. It's just when you hear it, you are anticipating a different kind of movie than the one you actually end up getting, which we discussed before. The Where... movie itself feels unkiltered or uneven, and it's much more slow moving than this main title would have you anticipate. You expect to have some heroic moments or some fast paced action or some exciting adventure. And there's really none of that in this movie. And that might just be an attempt to try and sell the movie and to, and, and to hook you from the beginning. That brings us to arguably the most lovely piece of music in the soundtrack, and that is oh. A Quiet Peace. Tell us about Quiet Peace. The Quiet Peace serves as the love theme for the protagonist, Tsukioka, played by Hiroshi Koizumi, and his uh, love interest, Hidemi, played by Setsuko Wakayama. And it's an absolutely lovely piece on strings and woodwinds. 
it's a beautiful contrast to the rest of the score because, as we mentioned, the rest of the score has a rather brooding atmosphere to it. It's very ominous in its sound. It seems to meander back and forth like the waves of the sea, never really going in any specific direction. This is a much more straightforward piece of music, kind of like the main title. The main title is clearly an adventure piece. This is clearly a romance piece. I guess in some ways you could say that the score for Raids Again is very much by the numbers. Oh, do we need something brooding? You got a brooding piece. Do we need a love theme? We have a love theme. There's not really any ambiguity about what this music is meant to be serving. It's a nice contrast to everything else. It's Everything else is, as you said, you know, a bit more ominous. While this is somewhat soothing, it's a nice oasis in all of this. Like the main title... This piece of music sounds like it jumped right out of a 1940s or 1950s Hollywood romance or drama piece. It's by far the most Western score we're going to hear until we get into the 1980s. Sato usually has a very distinct sound that is not heard in the West, typically. I think the closest thing you can associate with Masato Sato would be like Ennio Morricone, the famous uh, Italian composer of the spaghetti Westerns like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. I think that's probably his closest Western counterpart. But here, this sounds like it could have come right out of a 1950s, by the numbers, um, romance drama. So with the track Osaka and Ashes, we have what I would say the most Ifukube sounding track compared to the rest. It's right after that Osaka is destroyed after Anguirus is dead and Godzilla went on his own way. And even the shot is somewhat similar to after Tokyo was destroyed in Gojira. The difference is, I would say, is that Ifukube's track was more of a devastating requiem, in a sense, while Sato's, although somewhat downbeat, it is not as completely devastating as it was for uh, Gojira. And then, especially when you see the scene play out, It's not showing a hospital full of children losing their parents, and it continues on with the characters from the movie, but are casually joking about their business and so forth, and it's just a very big contrast to what Gojira displayed there. It is somewhat sad, but it's almost as if a hurricane has passed, there's some damage that's been caused, but it's nowhere near as devastating. It's almost more hopeful. Exactly, yeah, which there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, uh, we're, we're not depressing people. We we can have some hope in these soundtracks. But at the same time, when you're trying to display the effects of the destruction of something as grand as two kaijus battling out to the death and destroying everything in their path, uplifting, maybe upbeat is not the first thing that comes to mind. Whereas Gojira was a not-so-subtle metaphor for the bombing of Hiroshima, you could see Osaka in Raids Again being a stand-in for Nagasaki. And yet you don't seem to get the same, the same sense of gravitas and hopelessness that you had in Gojira. When Godzilla left Tokyo in ruins the previous year, it, it was the same result as if a nuclear bomb just blew up in the middle of your city and flattened it and killed a third of everyone living there. And now everyone you know is gone. Your way of life is gone. Your home is gone. Your business is gone. You now have radiation poisoning and you're handicapped. And you have this sense of hopelessness like, well, my life has just been taken away from me. Where do I go from here? Everything is in ruins. And Gojira with Fukube's music conveys that sense of that sense of loss. Whereas in this one, like you said, it's as if a bad storm blew through town and now people are out on their front porch thinking, well, shoot, there goes my front lawn. Looks like we're going to have to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. All right, Bill, grab the tools. Yeah, I lost my business. It's quite unfortunate, but hey, it's all good. Yeah, we'll just move to Hokkaido to uh, you know, to our other headquarters. And Until so, another kaiju comes to Ram. Yeah, which Godzilla, just, yeah, which Godzilla does. He follows them to Hokkaido. It's like, man, this guy's no got a grudge. There's place in Japan. Just accept it. Hokkaido, Sapporo, doesn't matter. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fine piece of music. I like it just fine, but I think the way that the scene is portrayed in the film is kind of nonchalant. The characters just seem oh-hum about it, and, and their joking attitude. It's like, yeah, I appreciate needing a sense of humor in the face of disaster, but it seems to be almost inappropriate 
for what should be the reality of the situation after such a devastating attack um, by Godzilla and Anguirus. The action music in the film, such as the adventurous main title, doesn't really ever play over what you would consider dynamic action, say uh, the monster battle or the airplanes dive bombing, dive bombing Godzilla. But what we do get are a few very brief and intense pieces of music, um, some staccato, uh, some blaring trumpets, uh, lots of crescendo and harps, and and it can be very dramatic. And, it, and some of these pieces honestly sound like they could build into a really nice um, epic battle royale, but they never do. The ending of the film, which has Godzilla on an icy island in the North Pacific being dive bombed by jet planes trying to bury him in an avalanche is surprisingly quiet. It makes for a very interesting effect, watching the climax of a movie without any music. In some ways, you might even argue that it gives it a an extra level of realism because you're just getting the raw sound effects of the explosions and Godzilla's roar and the jet plane engines. But at the same time, the scene carries on and on and on as well executed on a technical level with the special effects as the scene is it really does drag and i think it would have been helped if it had some exciting music to carry it along so that way you aren't self-aware of how many times you're watching the same explosions happening over and over and over again uh and curiously whether by sato's choice or oda's choice it's mostly music free which I think in some ways is a detriment to it. So I'm actually a little sad we didn't get extra music, even though we don't consider this to be a strong point in Sato's career. I think if he had uh, had, had been given the room to flex his musical muscles a little bit more and to write more music, we might have been able to get some really nice material. But he wasn't offered that opportunity, or he didn't feel that it was necessary, whatever the case might have been. So the the climax of the score is surprisingly brief and then it just wraps up with a really nice fanfare as we get the you know the kanji the end kanji at the end of the the scene even with the way that this ended you have the almost victorious trumpet as that uh japanese ending kanji comes up it's more of a yay we beat godzilla kind of more again a beat uh note which is very different from how Gogeta ended. It was very somber. It was very depressing. So at least it's a contrast to that. And it is some variation, but it does end in that more triumphant, heroic note. It's it's functional, though. It serves its purpose. It does well. But the score is just remarkably constrained. There isn't a lot of color in the score. It's mostly just very black. <laughs> It's quite monotone. It is for very. The most part. It's a very monotone score. Yeah. So we will let you enjoy the second score for for the Godzilla franchise. Normally we would close out and say a few goodbyes, but we've got a little surprise for you waiting after uh, you finish listening to Masato Sato's uh, suite for Godzilla Raids Again. So stay tuned, and we'll see you in about twelve minutes. <laughs> yeah, give or take. Give or take.
what are your thoughts on the overall score, Evan? It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that it is among my very least favorite Godzilla scores. Um, and not because it is bad music. I just find it compared to the other 34 Godzilla scores we've got at the moment to be mm -hmm. among the most uninteresting. Tastes vary. I have read reviews online of people who praise this score as being underrated and even fantastic and, and well-written. So, you know, each to their own. And some people really enjoy this movie. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I can objectively see the movie as being a lackluster Godzilla film. But I, it's got a soft, I got a soft place for it in my heart. It was one of my very first Godzilla movies. It might have even been the first Godzilla movie I saw from beginning to end in its entirety. My very first Godzilla, uh, my very first introduction to Godzilla was actually Godzilla vs. Megalon on the TV. And I was mostly just tuning in for the monster battle at the end. That's what I happened to catch. But I remember clearly receiving from my mom that she got probably from Walmart the VHS of Godzilla Raids Again and also of King Kong vs. Godzilla. And so Raids Again was my first Godzilla movie I've ever owned. My earliest memories of watching Godzilla movies can be traced back to, to this film. So I, I actually really like the movie for nostalgic reasons. And because I saw it through the eyes of a child who looked at the movie on in awe, I am able to see the movie for what it could have been and what it should have been rather than just seeing it for what it is. So my point is, I probably am looking at this movie through rose-tinted glasses. Well, it's an important movie in what it's, what it's established with the kaiju battle. So I would even argue, there is though, that. that... I would even argue, though, that the... The significance of kaiju battling is even more accredited to King Kong versus Godzilla rather than Godzilla Raids Again. It's significant in that it staged a kaiju battle. It's significant in that it's the first of its kind. It was a new idea. It was original. But it um, clearly didn't take off. I mean, Tanaka afterward shelved the Godzilla movies. It wasn't obvious that they should be pursuing a franchise here. Um, years later, Tanaka himself had admitted, We didn't have much preparation time, and it would be difficult for me to say the production was successful. And special effects cameraman Teisho Arakawa noted, Something was missing when we wrapped Godzilla Raids again. At the staff pre-release screening, people were talking about the first Godzilla movie. And I think that there's something to be said about that. It, it was clearly not just riding on the coattails of the first movie, it was standing in the shadows of, and it was not able to distinguish itself as a as a noteworthy monster film in its own right that you could be like, oh yeah, there are two Godzilla movies out there, and boy, are they great. No, it's, there's a Godzilla movie out there. Oh, And then there's a, that one. And then there's that one. <laughs> right. If, if box office returns are anything to go by, a movie doesn't have to be critically acclaimed to be financially successful. People want to see monsters destroy stuff, and that's what they got. Uh, we told you we had something a little special for you. Oh, is it special? So this movie begins a very unfortunate trend that continues throughout much of the Godzilla franchise's history, especially in the classic series. This film, like the predecessor, uh, had its distribution rights sold to an American producer or distributor. Like the first Godzilla movie, which we didn't talk about this aspect, we'll, we'll save this for episode 16. We'll go into detail with it more there. But the first Godzilla movie ended up being heavily edited when it came to the States. They cut out 40 minutes of the original Japanese film. They inserted about 30 minutes of extra material shot all in one day using um, Hollywood star Raymond Burr, famous for his core TV show Perry Mason. They the shuffled the film around a bit and they essentially took what was a serious, somber, anti-nuclear allegory and political satire of a movie and turn it more or less into just a run-of-the-mill 
1950s Monster and Loose B film. But fortunately, when they were making all these changes and dubbing the Japanese into English, for the most part, they preserved Akira Ifukube's score in the film, to their credit. That is not the case here. Nope. This film not only went through severe edits, it had almost all of Masaru Sato's original score removed. Pretty much the vast majority of music that Sato made was replaced with music from other movies at that time. And of course, it was known as Gigantus the Fire Monster. Now, I remember seeing the title of Gigantus when I was younger and being very confused as to why Gigantus looked almost exactly like Godzilla with Anguirus fighting. And I thought this must be some mistake, but it was done on purpose. So what what had happened at that time was that when the rights were bought by a company at the time called ABBT, they had the intention of replacing the Japanese actors with Caucasian actors and even setting the story in San Francisco under the title The Volcano Monsters. And that was going to be a huge difference just from that. Essentially, they were just going to cut out all the special effects scenes from the original and create their own movie around those scenes. Exactly. And so they even replaced Godzilla's roar with uh, Anguirus's roar as well. But that company fell into bankruptcy and was eventually bought off by Warner Brothers, which they stepped in and got the rights to the movie in 1959 and renamed it into the infamous Gigantus the Fire Monster to make people think it was a different monster. That didn't work. Yeah, now, the Warner Brothers film Gigantus is different than the Volcano Monsters. The Volcano Monsters was going to be a totally different movie with a totally different cast using just the special effects scenes. What Warner Brothers did was more akin to the, what they did with Gojira when it became Godzilla, King of the Monsters in the United States in 1956. They essentially dubbed the film, reshuffled some of the edits, uh, added a few, had added several scenes of stock footage and narration, a very obnoxious narration, and replaced uh, Masaru Sato's score. And what's so weird is that even despite all those changes, they could have still just called it a Godzilla movie. But they didn't. Yeah. No. Uh, actually, Paul Schreibman, who was one of the producers who acquired the rights, he also uh, acquired the rights of Gogeta as well. And he said this, We called it Gigantus because we didn't want it to be confused with Godzilla, who had clearly been killed irreparably by the oxygen destroyer. I could see why that it would be confusing seeing Godzilla already been dead by the Axe Destroyer and then he just comes back. Still well, slightly you know, blasphemous. They would have had that problem if in the their edit of Godzilla King of the Monsters they did not cut out Dr. Yamane's lament that if they keep testing nuclear weapons another Godzilla might appear somewhere. That was their foot in the door for a sequel and they just shot themselves in the foot. Yeah, it didn't work out so well. Mm-hmm. Never mind that if you really wanted to, with all the edits they were doing, they could have easily inserted some um, hack explanation for why another Godzilla was uh, around. So pretty much the vast majority of Sato's music was replaced. And it was replaced by a few cues that originated in the Paul Sattel slash Bert Schefter score for 1957's Kronos. So some of these cues were recycled for later pictures with a few motifs also used from 1958's It, The Terror from Beyond Space. And it's interesting, even the main title from Kronos is actually the main title used for Gigantus the Fire Monster. So the main cue or title theme that was in Raids Again is completely gone and replaced by the Kronos theme. So if you've only ever seen the American version of Godzilla Raids Again, then you've never actually heard Masato Sato's main title because it was entirely removed. I, I mean, not just from the main title sequence. It was removed from the film altogether because, of course, it's reprised throughout the movie. Exactly. And only a little bit of Sato's original score still remains in Gigantus. The you can hear... Part. Yeah, exactly. So thankfully they did have that, uh, at least. It's pretty much right before 
Godzilla first appears in Osaka Bay, which is one of my favorite parts of the soundtrack. There's also another excerpt that's heard about 40 minutes into the film when Godzilla's fighting with Anguirus in the metropolitan area of Osaka, as well as a third instance of Sato's score appears about 70 minutes into the movie when Godzilla climbs out of the pile of giant ice cubes that were covering him. So it's very hard to pick out throughout the soundtrack Sato's bits, but it's there, but it's barely there. It, it's just it's just a few crumbs left uh, behind. So it's pretty interesting how they just removed some of this without even even replacing it with a known score. So it was either replaced by familiar movies in Gigantus the Fire Monster uh, and their soundtrack, or it just had nothing at all. I believe that another film that they took music from um, by Paul and Bert was from uh, The Deerslayer. Because here at G-Score, we are a bunch of little completists that we would present to you a little bit of the music that came from Gigantus the Fire Monster in the form of the main title, which was taken from the main title of Kronos. Throughout our podcast, there will be a few occasions where the score for a Godzilla movie in its American release is so so fully removed and replaced with other music, we felt that it would be a wonderful gift, especially to you diehard Godzilla fans, for nostalgic purposes, if nothing else, to present with you a musical suite made up of the music from the American versions, which also provides an opportunity for anyone who's listening with a musically critical ear to hear the distinct difference between not only Japanese music and Western music, but the style, the mindset of what a monster movie should sound like. You know, the composers wrote music for these Japanese Godzilla movies to suit the movies. And they suit them very well. And yet when the movies went to America, they didn't think it was simply enough to dub the movies in English or to insert American actors in order to make the movie more palatable to Western audiences. They felt the need to change the score, sometimes a little, sometimes replacing it outright. Why? Why would Ifukube or Sato's music not sound as good to our ears as to Japanese ears? Is it too foreign? I'll let you be the decider of that. So when we come across those movies that have either had enormous amounts of new music inserted in or almost outrightly replaced entirely, we are going to present you with a part two to that episode. For example, our next episode, episode three, will be just such an example. We will have episode three, part one, where you will hear the original Akira Ifukube score for King Kong vs. Godzilla. And then we will present you with an episode three, part two, in which you will hear a suite comprised of the stock music that was inserted into King Kong vs. Godzilla for its American release, because aside from the Faroe Island chants, they removed all of Ifukube's music. Which was jarring to me. I had no idea it was removed to that degree. Uh, practically as an extensive of reworking of the score has happened in this film, Despite our very best efforts, we were not able to track down all of the very disparate cues from probably a dozen different sources, at least. We have failed you. We apologize. All we were able to dig up for your listening pleasure is the main title sequence from Kronos, which is also the main title for Gigantus the Fire Monster. So, please, enjoy um, Paul Sautel and Bert Shafter's Music for Kronos. <laughs> Thank you. 
I wish we could have presented to you the rest of the score, but we just unfortunately were not able to obtain that. Um, if ever in the future we come across it, or if any of our listeners know of where we can find the individual tracks that were used in Gigantus, please let us know and we will happily compile them and we can make a belated part two to this episode. Um, but we will for sure be having a part two for episode three, episode 16, and episode 24. Yeah. We might even give you a shout out. No, we won't do that. Yeah. We'll no, we won't. Out. No. no, no we, I don't care. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll happily give credit to anyone who can point us in the direction of such a treasure trove. Well, Jonathan, uh, this wraps up our discussion um, for Godzilla Raids again. Next week, we are going to be discussing one of the most popular of all Godzilla movies, the most financially successful of all Godzilla movies. The Godzilla movie that created the classic versus formula and that featured the two most popular kaiju in the entire world going head to head. King Kong versus Godzilla. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Evan. And this is the G-Score the Podcast. And remember, kids, banana oil is not a substitute for bravery. <laughs>